Hello and welcome to this mini webinar in the holiday spirit about cocoa and chocolate. My name is Taya Demers and I'm a registered dietitian and supervisor in the Perform Center's nutrition suite at Concordia University. Today I'm one of the cats from the ballet by Tchaikovsky called the Nutcracker. This ballet is often performed by ballet companies during the winter season. In this story, after some skirmishes with cats, mice, and each other, the characters enjoy a banquet with a first course of chocolate with a delicate Spanish flavoring. Bienvenue à ce petit atelier dans l'esprit de la saison au sujet du cacao et chocolat. Je m'appelle Théa Demers, je suis une diététiste nutritionniste et superviseur dans la salle de nutrition chez le Centre Perform à l'Université Concordia. Aujourd'hui, je, je fais partie des chats du ballet de Tchaikovsky, appelé Quatre Noisettes. Il est souvent interprété par des compagnies de ballet pendant la saison d'hiver. Dans l'histoire, après quelques escarmouches avec des chats, des souris et entre eux-mêmes, les personnages profitent d'un banquet avec un premier plat de, de chocolat avec un délicat arôme espagnol. A brief outline for this, this little webinar. We have some true or false questions, some background about cocoa and chocolate, and then a little summary of research looking at cocoa and heart health and our brain health. And then we'll talk about what types of chocolate and cocoa, how much, and healthy ways to enjoy cocoa and chocolate. We'll also be making a little recipe of some little chocolate bites. True or false? Chocolate was first eaten in Spain in the 1600s where only the wealthy class could afford it. That is false. Chocolate was eaten by the Mayan in Guatemala as early as 600 AD. However, Spain was the first European country to bring chocolate back to Europe and it was affordable only by the rich. The colonizer countries of Britain, France, and Holland competed to establish colonies in Central America and then increased production by establishing cocoa plantations in present day Indonesia, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, and later in Africa. Number two, cocoa beans, which are used to make chocolate, were once used instead of money in South America. This is true. The Mayans and Aztecs and other peoples in South America used cocoa beans to buy supplies. The Museum of the National Bank of Belgium documents that it was even used to trade for animals and human traffic of labor, laborers or slavery. For example, 10 beans would buy a rabbit. Number three, North Americans eat more chocolate than any other nation across the world. Mm, that's false. The top chocolate eaters live in Europe. 15 of the 16 leading chocolate eating countries are in Europe, with Switzerland leading the pack. North Americans don't even make it in the top 10. Number four, raw chocolate is the same as dark chocolate. This is false. Raw chocolate is not synonymous for dark chocolate. It's also known as raw cacao, and it's essentially cold pressed cocoa beans. As unprocessed chocolate, cocoa is available most com commonly as cocoa powder or raw chocolate nibs. The main difference between the raw chocolate and regular dark chocolate is that raw chocolate has not been heated. This could raise risks as some bacteria are inactivated by heat and raw cacao has increased risk for contamination. It is important to note that the research studies looking at health effects of cocoa have used cocoa that has been roasted and fermented and processed with heat to kill bacteria. Some background. So chocolate and cocoa are made from cocoa beans which come from the fruit of the Theobroma tree. The cocoa beans are fermented, roasted, ground, and then separated into cocoa powder and butter. It has long been used as a medicinal remedy. And on a daily basis, cocoa or chocolate is the third highest source of antioxidants per person in North America. It is, however, higher in saturated fat. And depending on what you're eating, it can also be higher in added sugar. It has been known also to have antioxidant potential. And this is attributed to its flavonoids. What are flavonoids? They're a group of natural substances with variable phenolic structure. So this is its chemical structure. 
The same type of structure can be found in fruits, vegetables, grains, bark, roots, stems, flowers, tea, and wine. Flavonoids are well known for their beneficial effects on health and efforts are being made to isolate the ingredients of these flavonoids. So some actions of flavonoids in general, they have an antioxidant effect. So one example of that in our bodies is that it protects our cell membranes from what we call re reactive oxygen species. And it can also encourage processes that reduce inflammation. So an example in our body is, is that it can sometimes counter some stress hormones. It also has been known to have antithrombotic effects. So an example of that is that it can reduce formation of, of blood clots in your, in your body. And for vasodilatory effects, it encourages blood flow to certain areas of your, your body because it causes the blood vessels to dilate, to become bigger. So you see two spoons there of cocoa powder. You might be wondering what is the difference between the two? So the one on the right is an example of a red brown Dutch process cocoa. So this cocoa has been treated to reduce the acidity of it so that it has a less of a bitter taste. However, that process um, also reduces the flavonoid content. So one tablespoon of that cocoa has around 83 milligrams of flavonoids. The natural brown or black cocoa, um, or it can be lighter brown as you see here, has not been processed with that alkali. Uh, it has just been roasted and fermented in the, the steps that I described previously, and its flavonoid content is higher, around 208 milligrams per tablespoon on average. So we're going to get cooking, making our little chocolate bites. So this recipe can be looked at as vegan if you use maple syrup. You also need some cocoa powder, some coconut oil. So two thirds cups of, of each of those and then a third cup of your sugar source. If you're not making a vegan version, you can use um, uh, honey or a different type of syrup or you can also um, try it with sugar, but this might change the consistency a little bit. You can add some vanilla extract and salt. Uh, however, they're not necessary in the version we'll be making. I didn't add those, but you can add them if you want. For some other variations, you can try using uh, tahini, uh, sesame tahini or peanut butter. Uh, you can use cayenne powder and mint, not all at the same time, just one or another. And then what we'll be doing today, I'll be dividing the, the batter or the chocolate in half and then adding to one half some sesame seeds and tahini, uh, two tablespoons of each, and to the other portion of what we'll be making, I added some cayenne pepper. So let's take a look. So here we have our mini muffin paper molds. I put the ones that I'm using for cayenne with a different design so I can tell them apart. Here I'm measuring the ingredients, the two thirds cup of coconut oil and cocoa powder. I just put a starting portion of the coconut oil, then I'm gonna melt it in the microwave and add a bit more until I get my two thirds cup. Here's the rest of the ingredients, the one third cup maple syrup, the two tablespoons tahini and sesame seeds and the cayenne pepper. So I just melt the coconut oil in increments of 20 to 40 seconds. And then as it melts, then I, and I was able to get the two third cups, then I add it to my saucepan. And we're gonna keep that on low. Depending on your stove, you wanna be as low as possible. So ideally below three, if you, your stove has numerical, um, indices or as close to low as possible. So then we add the cocoa powder and we mix it well. And the reason too we're keeping it on low is that as the oil heats, we don't want to scald or burn that cocoa powder because that will take, change the taste of your little chocolate bites. And we don't want to heat the sugar too long either because that could burn easily. So we're just gonna mix it in. So I mentioned you could use a granulated sugar or, um, or brown sugar as well. However, that will make the texture a little bit more grainy. Um, the maple syrup and honey keeps a nice smooth consistency. So 
So now we're going to divide the batter um, or the chocolate, sorry, and remove from heat. I'm going to pour a portion off into our measuring cup and then add the tahini and sesame seeds. And then we just mix it in. Stirring the last little bit there. <laughs> There's the sesame seeds. and the cayenne pepper to the remaining part. I'm gonna mix that in so it's really quick. Then you just spoon the chocolate into the mini paper muffin molds, making sure you know which design you're using for which type. So you're well prepared when you bite into that hot chocolate. <laughs> And then the remaining molds we'll be making with the tahini and sesame seed. And then you just chill these in the in a cold place until firm. And this recipe is adapted from the coconut mama. So I'd like to summarize a little bit of the research about cocoa and your health. A systematic review by Hooper et al. In, published in 2012 found that there's some evidence that cocoa reduces symptoms in heart disease. It can reduce the risk of fatal strokes or heart attacks in heart disease. It improves blood flow as it affects vasodilation or your blood vessels um, getting wider. It can undo damage to blood vessels linked to high blood pressure and heart disease or endothelial dysfunction and it lowers systolic and diastolic blood pressure. For our brains, among participants who had lower blood flow in, in their, their brains or to their brains, after drinking a, a cup of hot cocoa daily for a month, they showed improved measures of blood flow to certain working regions of the brain, and they improved their times on tests of working memory. So this was a study published in Neurology in 2013. A subsequent study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2014 also found that those participants improved performance on some cognitive tests. The COCO Cognition and Aging Study, or the COCO Study, in 90 older adults, they consumed daily uh, for eight weeks a drink, a hot cocoa drink, having a higher level of flavonoids, so unprocessed cocoa. And then they also showed improvement on tests that measured factors such as attention, verbal fluency, and working memory. In 2014, there was a study published in Nature where they were looking at a lifestyle intervention. So they asked the participants to exercise as well as consume a diet that was higher in cocoa flavanols. And they found that, and this was done in adults aged 50 to 69 years of age, and there was 37 adults. They were also looking for improving the function of the dentate gyrus, because this is believed to have an impact on, um, on memory. So they uh, asked them to exercise and have this um, diet for a period of three months. And for those who had the higher flavanol cocoa group, so the cocoa that is uh, less processed, they found that they improved performance on tests of recognition and patterns. And looking at the dentate gyrus function using functional MRI, they found that blood flow and blood vessel density, so having more blood vessels in the area of the dentate gyrus and more blood flow to that area um, was also, uh, was, they found that as well when they looked at that under fMRI. So just a little summary, but the next time you want to grab a cup of hot cocoa, you can make this really simply and you can manage then the sugar content by just having uh, like a teaspoon of cocoa or two teaspoons of cocoa and a teaspoon of sugar. And you can add a, a beverage like, a, like milk or it could be a different type of uh, calcium rich beverage and heat it up for a minute and a half and you have a nice cup of hot cocoa. Cocoa has also been ported, purported to positively impact mood. This is linked to the compound phenylethylamine, which is similar to amphetamines. 
However, the level of this in chocolate is much lower than what has been shown to exert the pharmacological effect on mood in humans. So there's possibly other explanations for the euphoric effect of chocolate. It could be its carbohydrate or sugar content. It could possibly be the caffeine content or even more possibly due to learned experience because we often associate chocolate with, uh, with good times. So we need more research in this area. And as a point of reference for the caffeine content, so there's one, eight milligrams of caffeine in one tablespoon of cocoa. As a reference for a cup of coffee of around 250 milliliters, there's 140 milligrams of caffeine. The same volume for a cup of tea is 40 to 60 milligrams of caffeine. For a 45 gram dark chocolate bar, there's 20 milligrams of caffeine. And for a 45 gram milk chocolate bar, there's only nine milligrams of caffeine. So the caffeine content in cocoa is relatively low. The highest levels of flavanol compounds are found in this order. So firstly in cocoa powder, secondly in baking chocolate unsweetened, thirdly in dark chocolate bars, and lastly in milk chocolate. I checked in with Dr. LaBelle uh, from Concordia and he mentioned that the trick is to understand the percent cocoa on the packaging. He said 70% can mean 20% cocoa butter and 50% cocoa solids, but it can also mean 45% cocoa butter and 25% solids. So in general, you wanna look for cocoa that has a higher pro proportion of cocoa solids. He says a few squares can keep the doctor away, especially dark chocolate, which has less sugar and fat. I manage to eat a little bit of chocolate every day, but the key is you don't have to eat a lot to be satiated. He also stays active in spite of having a desk job on a daily basis. So dark or unsweetened chocolate or cocoa with at least 60% cocoa solids can be part of a healthy diet when consumed in moderation. In 2019, Canada released our new food guide after an extensive review of evidence and consultations with the public. The evidence found that a pattern of meals and snacks is more important than superfoods or diets or a focus on just one individual nutrient. In consulting with people like you and me, they found that people wanted a practical tool. With half the plate featuring vegetables and fruits, we can choose dark leafy greens or bright orange and red vegetables and a variety of fruits. A quarter of the plate featuring our protein foods, so it could be legumes, nuts, eggs, uh, milk, yogurt, fish, or meats, nut, and uh, the remaining quarter of the plate featuring our grains. And there's a, a variety of examples of grains there as well. So if we can have meals that have these prep portions of these food, three food groups and snacks that have two of the food groups, we are well on our way for meeting our needs for each of our vitamins, our minerals, and carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and dietary fiber. All foods can fit, but what is important is how often we eat them. So some foods can be foods that are more uh, eaten on an an exceptional basis and some foods we eat occasionally and other foods we want to eat daily, like our, the dietary pattern from Canada's food guide. Added sugars and added fats like those found in chocolate can be, be consumed. However, we want to choose items that have less saturated and trans fats, sodium and added sugars, and choose foods that have more fiber and protein. So we can do that using labels. This is an example of um, from our little chocolate bite. So for one bite, we get around nine grams of fat, seven grams of which are saturated, and we get 20 milligrams of sodium and five grams of added sugar. Conversely, we get very little fiber, one gram and one gram of protein and we don't get too much in the way of vitamins and minerals either. So we can look at this rule of 5% is a little and 15% is a lot. We can see that this is higher on the added fat side and then there's a little bit of added sugar. 
So it's definitely um, something that we were not going to have uh, too much of. But if we think of it in terms of our recommendations, it's recommended to have, depending on who you talk to, either less than six teaspoons or less than 10 or 12 teaspoons of added sugar on a daily basis. If we would take the weight of one teaspoon of added sugar, it's around four or five grams. So this um, little bite has around one teaspoon of added sugar. So it can be part of a sweet that you might enjoy. If we can keep your total daily added sugar amount to less than six teaspoons. For added fats, the recommendation is to have less than two tablespoons of added fat. So this includes our salad dressings. It includes if you put butter or a non-hydrogenated margarine on your, your bread or, um, or add it into anything else. And so this would represent around two teaspoons or just under two teaspoons of added fat. And in two tablespoons, you have six teaspoons. So Again, it can be part of your, your daily or, um, or perhaps weekly uh, suite that you enjoy, but we want to be attentive and mindful of the rest of our choices so that we can make sure that we can still meet our, our needs for our, for our overall dietary pattern. And there are, are other ways to enjoy flavonoids. So if you wanna make sure you're getting flavonoids in your diet um, that don't have the fat and sugar found in chocolate, choose berries, apples, citrus fruits, grapes, nuts, onions, and green tea more often. There is no target amount for flavonoids that we need in our diet. So eating these foods will provide both flavonoids and other important nutrients. So to summarize, Choose dark chocolate that is at least 60% cocoa solids. Keep portions small and use cocoa powder for baking and for making a hot cocoa beverage. Avoid chocolate with candy coatings, creamy centers, or added nuts, as these are often higher in calories and sugar and lower in flavonoids. So thanks so much for your attention and wish you uh, the best for the holidays. Take care and stay safe.